Let's just open in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this occasion when we can gather together. Speak to our hearts this morning, we pray. May our hearts be enlarged and filled with love for you as we open your word together. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just for those who are visiting with us, my name is Neil Schock, S-C-H-O-C-H. -C -H. I've been taking a few liberties with my introduction there, and I'm not a qualified professor of cardiology, <laughs> even though those little letters after it are those of a cardiologist up until the point of ANZ, and then I got confused with banks. So <laughs> if I do surgery on anyone's heart this morning, you can use the ANZ bank to pay me because it's a very expensive surgery. <laughs> I don't have a medical degree, but I am a fitter and turner by trade. Peter and Turner is someone who takes fits and turns on a regular basis. <laughs> Not this morning. The Peter and Turner, we use the same tools as an orthopedic surgeon, and I would love to have a go. I told mine that I could do the job just as good as him once, and he got very upset. I was visualising the human skeleton from which I could easily do a diffusion operation and ignoring things like skin and blood and nerves and all the rest of it, slightly complicated things. But never mind. This morning, I want to talk about a healthy heart from a biblical sense. Some 25 years ago, I was diagnosed with some of these complaints. I was told to make the most of whatever time I had, because it may not be too long. And I just told the doctor that the Lord was in control of my heart and I had no concerns whatever. And he looked at me as if I was stark raving man. Maybe you'd like a second opinion before you allow me to operate on your beating heart. If so, there's one there. And it's not a second opinion, it's the only answer for heart's problems. Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. A discerner speaks to me a bit like an x-ray, an MRI, a CAT scan, from my medical knowledge but it's far more powerful and effective than any man-made machine. And we need to allow every day God's Word to operate on our lives and our hearts. Many New Year's Eve resolutions would have been made. I've never made one and therefore never failed to keep one. But getting fit and healthy, losing weight and all those sort of things come commonly up and you need to get a good health checkup before you start strenuous exercise and you need to start eating healthy food. A medical colleague of mine called Dr Google tells me that the human heart beats approximately 42 million times a year and by the time you reach 80, and no it didn't go far enough to reach someone's age, it has beaten 3,363,840 times. Human engineers would love to be able to make an, a, a pump that efficient. Many times in the early hours of the morning on Strawbrook Island, I was called out to the sand mines to fix a pump. If only they could have a pump like that. But I'm very interested in medicine because I watch every medical show that's ever come on TV and I reckon I'm just about qualified. <laughs> Especially the glory bits. I freeze them on the TV screen, wait for Norma to come out and point to it and she looks at it. I'm not very good at stitching things together again though, but Norma's an expert at it. Except that she paints at the side of blood, so I'll have to use a uh, staple gun. Getting back, what is the heart in a biblical sense? The heart speaks of the seat of life and strength, the mind or emotions, the soul, possibly the spirit, although that is the most inner part of man that belongs to God, the central part of mankind that belongs to him. When a friend or loved one dies, even in the secular world, the common expression is, well, we'll remember them forever in our hearts. 
not the mind, but in the heart. It is a deeper part of the body. And it was actually in one of the choruses this morning about our names being written on the heart of God, used in a similar sense. So the heart is the focus of affection rather than the mind. God has already given us a priceless gift. He has put eternity into our hearts, Ecclesiastes 3.11. Everybody has it, but it must be realised that it comes from the one true God, and we must believe in Him. Every civilization, civilization of mankind that has ever existed has a belief in God. Everyone has a belief in some sort of life after death. Don't come back as a caterpillar in my garden, or you'll end up sophisticated very quickly. And I apologise to those who are new here for my strange sense of humour. Sadly, there are many false beliefs that have all come from that original truth of the God of the Bible. The heart of man is known by God. You bring that up, thank you, Linda. Linda's done an amazing job of this. Thank you very much. That includes believers and unbelievers. God is omniscient. There is nothing, absolutely nothing hidden from Him. Many scriptures speak about it. Proverbs 22, 21-2 Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the hearts. A haughty look, a proud look, is sin. Just that expression on your face. If I was to stand here and look down on you with some haughty look, Whatever that is, I don't know. 1 Kings 8.39 And give to everyone according to all his ways, whose hearts you know. For you alone know the hearts of all the sons of men, that they may fear you all the days that they live in the land that you gave to our fathers. In 1 Samuel 16.7 When Saul had failed as king and David was to be selected, but the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, <clears throat> for the Lord does not see as men see. So we can be thankful for that. For well, man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Jeremiah 17:9 is probably one of the most commonly known and quoted scriptures. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways. The unregenerate heart of man is truly desperately wicked and deceitful in every way. But there is good news, and we come to that Proverbs 14. <clears throat> a sound heart is life to the body. In chapter 4, 23, keep your heart full diligence. For out of it spring the issues of life. Heart disease. High blood pressure, <clears throat> pulse rate. I used to have that. Naturally it's dangerous resulting in heart failure due to burnout. Spiritually it may be good, but a balance is needed. Pastors who try and do everything usually burn out. There you go, Michael. Feeling good? That's good. They have to preach, they have to marry people, they have to bury people, they have to control the youth group, they have to counsel. And it's just too much for one person to do and sadly it results in burnout so many times. Even Jesus went away into a quiet place and rested and prayed. Low blood pressure and pulse rate. It's probably my problem now. It's called old age. You feel cold and clammy. Possibly like the church at Laodicea, which was described as being lukewarm, disinterested, or half hearted. Diagnosis they were reliant on their own abilities and wealth, but spiritually poor. Pure, receive the Lord and rely on His power and His alone. Be zealous and repent. Tachycardia, I had that one also. It means that your heart rate keeps changing from either too fast or too slow. 
the conversion, we have that great rush of emotion and desire to get out and tell everybody about the Lord. But then the trials of life sometimes can get us down. A balanced life in service, <clears throat> excuse me, will be more productive in the long time. And I might need surgery on my voice before I'm finished here. Arrhythmia is simply the heart rate keeps, sorry, the heart beats out a rhythm. I have that also. It's caused by an electrical pathway in the heart. And the doctor will put a probe up into your heart. You can watch it on the screen beside you. You can feel that probe going around your heart. If they find it, they zap it for laser and the problem is over. But they couldn't find it in me. But if we get mixed up <clears throat> in this world and the things of this world, that extra, if you like, electrical pathway will put us out of balance and will never be truly effective in our service for the Lord. Cardiomyopathy, which I'm thankful to say I've never had, commonly referred to as an enlarged heart. Naturally dangerous, but spiritually very good. Isaiah 60, five, <clears throat> verse 5, Then you shall see and become radiant, and your heart shall swell or be enlarged with joy. It's referring to the kingdom age of Israel. Other translations, thrill and rejoice. 2 Corinthians 6.11 O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open or enlarged. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. May our heart's affection be open one to another here this morning. A vow of regurgitation sounds nice, doesn't it? Commonly referred to, thank you, Joan, as a leaky vow. I also have one of those. <clears throat> it lowers the blood pressure, <clears throat> not enough blood is being pumped to the body, resulting in weakness. The remedy <clears throat> is a new or a repaired heart. I used to even use pig's heart, pig's valves, and insert them in. Us cardiologists got confused when we used our stethoscope because all we heard was oink, oink, oink. Mm. But spiritually, allow the Holy Spirit to have free reign flowing throughout your body with full pressure and full access to every part of the human body. You will go there anyway. Hardening of the arteries is probably the most common. Fatty deposits of plaque block the flow of life giving blood. And Satan is seeking to block off those arteries. If the heart is not pumping the blood through freely, the oxygen will not get to your brain and you'll only have minutes to live. And also the blood takes the nutrients and nutrition to every part of the body doing exactly what God designed it to do. And so it's important not to have hardened arteries. The Bible speaks about a heart of stone. It sounds a bit like bigger mortars are set in. Mark 3, 5. Jesus was angry and grieved by the Pharisees by their hardness of heart. They had 600 extra regulations and rules which they rigorously imposed apart from the Ten Commandments. But what about us, the disciples? When it came, they saw the miracle of the loaves and the fishes, and yet they didn't really believe and understand because their hearts were hardened. And the question is, in chapter 8, is your heart still hardened? I wonder <clears throat> if God ever has to say that to us. As he examines our heart and knows the thoughts and the intents of it, is your heart still hardened? How sad that would be. Have you doubted that God can do great things through you? He has a plan and a purpose 
As Paul said, I can do all things Christ who strengthens me. The cause in us, poor diet and lack of exercise. Simple really, a piece of cake or maybe not. The cure initially that Christ may dwell through faith in your hearts. I trust he dwells through faith in the heart of every single person here this morning. And that's followed by a life of obedient service to him. Romans 10, <coughs> speaking of conversion, says, With your mouth, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe with your heart that God has raised you from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And spend your rest of your life feeding and being nourished on the Word of God and walk in the truth of it. No spiritual junk food diet, TV, magazines, books, everything that the sinful world is attracted to will only harden the arteries of your heart which hinders the flow and work of the Holy Spirit within us as we run with endurance the race that is set before us. Our hearts in Hebrews 3.9 are to be established by grace, and we sing about that this morning. Not getting carried away of all sorts of foolish disputations in various and strange doctrines. And John 1 John 1.9, which is in one of those books that I didn't see in that list, John. Yeah. Thanks for picking it up. Actually, it was normal. You can blame her for that. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. David, whose heart God looked at, he knew his heart. And David, after singing of Bathsheba, Pray to God, create in me, O God, a clean heart. A broken heart, O God, you will not despise. Sometimes we need that brokenness of heart to allow him to come in and repair the damage that we do to it. The healthy heart, purity of heart and purity of mind and purity of speech go together. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. True righteousness, faith, love, peace for those who call on upon the Lord with a pure heart. And 1 Peter 1.22, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. My GP has a medical degree, obviously. He also has a degree in theology. He was talking to me about this theologian and sadly he started to swear. And that was so disappointing. My previous doctor was a Christian and he loved to talk about the Bible, which is good. But again, that language had crept into his heart and into his mind and came out through his mouth. We need to be that bright light shining out into this sin-darkened world. We need to speak purely so that people will go away and say, I wonder why those people don't swear. They see that difference in us, in our speech and the way in which we live our lives. A soft and tender heart. That's important. Two Kings speaks about your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke. I also heard you. Is that the state of our heart this morning? Is it soft and tender? 2 Corinthians 3, 2 to 3. And that is a commendation or comment in the early church. The false teachers were writing their own letters of recommendation and boastfully writing them. And Paul says, The only letter I need is you yourself. By looking at the good change in your hearts, and I like that too. A good change in your hearts. Everyone can see that we have done a good work among you. They can see that you are a letter from Christ written by us. It is not a letter written with pen and ink, but by the Spirit of the living God. Not one card, one stone, but with human hearts, or the fleshy tables of their heart. 
truly soft and tender heart. May our hearts be so impressionable that God's word will sink in and permeate not just our heart, but through it our entire life. A whole heart. You shall love the Lord your God of all your heart, of all your soul, and of all your mind, of all your strength. All your heart. That old hymn, all to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. That hymn's brought me to tears quite often. And I had to stop singing it because I knew there are areas in my life that weren't truly given over to him. Psalm 119, I want to go through various little snippets from here. And I want to do it, it's a long psalm, but I want to do it as if it was a New Year's resolution from us here today. Not maybe a New Year's resolution, forget about that. But a resolve from our hearts out of love for the Lord. And I'm just going to read these through slowly and pause. Maybe shut your eyes and just meditate upon it as we consider these things before the Lord this morning so that maybe our resolve to carry on throughout this year in accordance with these words. Psalm 119 speaks much about the Word of God and the importance of the Word of God. It doesn't use that term, it speaks about speaks about statutes which are written rules or precepts which are spoken or oral rules, testimonies, commandments. But for us, let's just think of it as this book where God has revealed everything that he wants us to do and to be. I will seek him with the whole heart. I will praise you with uprightness of heart. With my heart I will seek and I will have will seek you. Oh let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. I will run the course of your commandments, for you shall enlarge my heart. Incline my heart to your testimonies. I entreated your favour with my whole heart. I will keep your precepts with my whole heart. Let my heart be blameless regarding your statutes, that I may not be ashamed. Your testimonies I will take as a heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. I will incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the very end. I cry out my whole heart, Hear me, O Lord, but my heart stands in awe of your word. I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. I just want to repeat two of those. I will incline my heart to perform your statutes, your word, everything you have asked me to do in your book, the Bible forever to the very end and my heart stands in awe of your word I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure there's 13 hearts in that passage and it's not an unlucky number Finally, Colossians 3, 23, and whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Willingly, enthusiastically and wholeheartedly, let's give it our very all for the Lord in this year to come. This year, may our hearts be soft and tender, enlarged by love, 
toward the Lord and towards the Lord's people everywhere. Never forgetting those in deep need, especially those who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Saviour and as their Lord. How spiritually healthy is my or your heart? May we just take this on board and I trust we'll meditate on it and think of it as we go into this year to come. May it be so for his name's sake. My voice it seems to be cured now. Would you like me to go another 30 minutes or <laughs> Okay, that one of the verses that I thought 